Scott. Yeah, it is Scott. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, if you get nothing else from this talk, at least you'll know I have large hands. And uh, to this date, I'm yet to find someone with larger hands. So, you know, it's just but kind of, yeah, birth defect. <laughs> yeah, and that's pretty much my talk. I'm kind of done there. Um, I am Scott. I, I'm kind of excited to be at DrupalCon because for uh, four or five years, I've been coding with Drupal under a rock. I've been that guy under the rock in Sydney, not Melbourne, uh, who um, is learning platforms, learning a bunch of different systems, loves programming, loves code, but I don't really share that with the community. I've never really been all that involved. And so I, um, I've kind of taken and taken and taken and taken from Drupal, and it's a little bit of an opportunity now, Drupal, where I can give a little bit back. Um, but I am 25 years old. Um, I work at a digital agency in Surrey Hills in Sydney called Streetline Media. And I'll talk a little bit about them in a second. Um, but I've got two, two main passions, really, um, that where I am now in life, I think I've found a way to bring the two of them together. Um, the first passion is, is for all things digital, for, for code and for design and that kind of thing. The second passion is, is for social justice um, and a real passion to see human rights um, uh, received for everyone in the world and human development, um, overcoming issues such as poverty um, and a real passion for equality, social equality, that kind of social side to um, how I want to live my life and what I want to see myself achieve um, in the time that I have here on Earth and this passion for all things digital alongside that. And so for the last 10 years, I've been developing in various things. I've been in designing in various things and I've been a freelancer for about seven of those years. Um, started in high school. I made flash games with my best friend and we had a skate, uh, skate crew in the day and at night would make flash games. And, um, and it sparked this interest of, of pulling things apart, learning how they work um, and doing so digitally. And so that led into a few freelance opportunities with some family and friends, which continued for about seven years um, as I formed a little bit of a business. Um, I went through training, which had nothing to do with anything digital whatsoever. Um, spent a bit of time working with World Vision, again, doing nothing to do with computers or anything like that. I was, um, I was working with high school students, inspiring them to do the 40-hour famine. Um, but along the way, I just constantly just pursued in my, you know, my downtime, in, in the hours I had free, I pursued the web. I pursued digital things online. And, um, and I really formed this love for, for two things about digital. Um, it was a real love for bits and pixels. I love code and I love design and I'll never be amazing at code and I'll never be amazing at design. But this fence in between, looking at the two of them and using one to inform the other is that place where I love working. It's that place where I love doing digital things. And so um, in my current role at the moment, um, you know, I, I get to, I'm the, I'm the technical director at Streetline Media or a digital agency of about 10, um, 10 people. And um, I get to spend half my day in Sublime Text and another half of my day in Photoshop. You know, I get to spend half of my day working through um, checking things and committing things into my GitHub repository and the other half of my day with a pen, sketching things out and drawing and, and working with our designers to, um, to find kind of visual solutions. Um, then working with our developers to see how we build that out. And um, by no means uh, are we a Drupal shop at Streetline Media, um, but we are huge advocates of Drupal. And so as a digital agency, we do a number of things, but where we can, um, our weapon of choice and our arguments to our clients is let's move towards Drupal. Let's move towards a platform which gives you the options that you need um, because you've been on Joomla for 40, 14 years and there hasn't been an update to it since. And, um, and so Streetline Media is where I've found myself kind of for the last three years. Um, it's a company that a friend of mine who had a similar story to me and I, we, we both formed this company, uh, Streetline Media. And we formed it with one kind of core idea in mind. And it was finding that balance between digital and social change. How do we build a business? How do we build a, a social enterprise which is going to work towards human rights outcomes, work towards a better world by pioneering new media, by using new technology and applying that to the world's issues? By um, uh, Jim Wallace said, your vocation um, is where your skills and your passions meet the overarching needs of the world. And we really believe that um, as professionals, we can do that in our work. And we can build a business which doesn't measure our success by the profits that we make at the end of the financial year, but it me measures it by the lives that we transform through the things that we create. And so we do a bunch of work for um, organizations like World Vision. Uh, this is World Vision <laughs> International Drupal site that we're launching on Acquia in a couple of weeks. Um, and it's also a responsive site. 
Um, last year, we did a rebuild of Fairtrade Australia's um, and Fairtrade New Zealand, their digital platform. And that was a, um, actually this one, I'll come back to in a second. The Fairtrade Australia, that was another Drupal site. And it was another responsive Drupal site. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these guys later on because there were some really great learnings that we got from that. But we also work in, um, we also work in iPhone apps and mobile. So while we love online publishing on desktops and on the web and in the browser, um, I personally have a real passion for having tools available in people's hands which can bring about real change. So this app here is one that World Vision came to us. Um, and they asked us, they said, it, it was the church part of World Vision, they said, we want to create an app, a resource for our supporters in the church who can pray for us, pray for the work that we're doing in the, in the field. When there's an emergency, we can send out an alert and say, hey, get your, um, uh, get your people together, let's pray for this issue. And, and um, let's kind of mobilize that Christian side of the work of, of what World Vision was doing. So this is an app that we built, powered by Drupal, a native app, which was um, giving those... Uh, the work of World Vision and giving that power to, to World Vision's church supporters. Um, and so that place between mobile and the web and digital communication um, is really where we love working and the organizations like the World Visions of the world um, who are trying to achieve things digitally, that's really where we want to target our services and see the change that we do make a really big impact. Um, so for us as a company, we really believe that we can be involved in changing the world through design, through development, through bits and pixels. And we're trying to design change one client at a time, one website at a time. But we also have our own ideas and we're also driven by this entrepreneurial spirit, this idea of innovation where we can take our learning and we can apply that to needs we see in the world at the moment. So we try and give a fraction of our week each week to uh, developing ideas, to working with our skills to make something happen. And for me, this is something that I've always tried to do over the last 10 years, is if I have tools in my belt, I want to use them right now to make a difference in the world, whatever that may be. And for the last 10 years, those tools have been digital. And so about five years ago, um, I was in Tasmania, and um, I'll tell the story in a second, but I came up with this idea called Fairly Local. Uh, and it's what I want to talk to you about today, because Fairly Local's had this fun journey over the last five years or so, um, and the last two years have been a, a heavily Drupal journey. And now for me, it was this great learning of me getting involved in Drupal. Um, I'm, I'm by no means a, a Drupal expert on a scale from one to Dries. I'm about two. Um, but I think that's what's amazing about the Drupal community is because while I'm at two, um, there's all this work for me to get ahead in Drupal. Two is an empowering place to be. Um, and two is a place where I'm not contributing to core. I don't you know, write custom modules and um, put on a Drupal.org or anything like that. Um, but I do have a login on Drupal.org and I can build a website and I can advise our digital team on how to build it and how to structure our, our data modeling and how to um, engage with views and custom modules to um, solve some of the problems that we face on the projects that we do. And so Fairly Local is this fair trade locator. It's about finding ethical products where you are. It's about using your iPhone or using the website to find um, the nearest fair trade cafe, to find that Cadbury block of chocolate which you're just craving um, and you have no idea where the nearest store is. And so it started as this idea for me where, and we'll look more about this later on, I want to just skip past this. Started as this idea for me in 2007. I was working with World Vision at the time, I was freelancing in my spare time and I was just starting to kind of get a little bit involved in Drupal. I was, you know, at the 0.01 on that scale of my involvement with Drupal. And uh, I was down in Tasmania and I was talking to high school students um, about these children that I'd met on a, on a trip I went with World Vision across to India. And I was talking to them about child labor and, and, and child rights issues. And I was, um, I was sitting uh, outside a car rental place in Hobart, just craving a coffee because I was really tired. Um, and I was, you know, impassioned at the time and wanted to find a fair trade coffee because little consumer decisions that I make can make a big impact if I make them regularly and, and I'm using my voice to share those thoughts. Um, and so I didn't know where to start and so I started going around a few ca cafes asking if they had anything. No one had anything so I thought what if, what if there was a resource? What if I could just pull out my iPhone and just say find me something nearby which is fair trade, find me a nearby cafe. 
Um, and as I generally do when I'm trying to think up ideas, the first thing I think of is a pun. So my sense of humor is really bad. Um, and it generally centers around puns. And so I was thinking, if only there was like a local way to find something fair, like fair, fair, fairly local. And that's where I started. I had the, the name. And I thought, well, how would you build that? How would you make something like that? And started thinking in the back of my head, I don't know. I work with HTML and I build websites and tables. Um, I have no idea how to make a website which would do any of these kind of location-based things. Um, but the first thing I did was check if the domain was available. The domain was available, and so that was an open door to start exploring it. And so I, um, I found my coffee, and I sat down, and I started to think about what this might look like. And I pulled out my laptop, and I started to explore to see if there was anything like it online. Uh, and I couldn't. I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find any resources. So I thought, I could do this. I could make a difference in the world through a website. It may not be a huge difference, but it'll be a difference. And any difference can have a huge impact. Um, and so I started to think, um, what might a, a fair trade locator look like? What might it be to, uh, what might a resource look like to find fair trade wherever you are in Australia? And, um, and my general philosophy is, if it, if it doesn't exist yet, then build it. And so for about six months um, in my downtime, I'd, I'd you know, buy a book or I'd read a, um, a topic. I don't know if Stack Overflow existed at the time, but that would have helped me a whole heap back at this time. Um, and I would just try and figure out what it, you know, how you do spatial measurement and what azimuth means and um, how you do some kind of a location-based thing in a MySQL table. And, um, and none of that made any sense to me. And I found a whole bunch of code which, you know, if I copied and pasted it all together, I'd end up with this spaghetti script which would output some kind of a function. And about six months in, I had this prototype. Um, and I thought, this is cool, this could work. This looks horrible, but it could work. It could do something as a website. And, um, and then I got distracted for you know another six months or so. And then I came back to it, I thought, this is horrible, this is horrendous, I've got to build it again. And so I built it again. I wiped the, um, wiped the slate clean, I thought, I'm going to build it again. That's, and that's kind of the story of Fairly Local, to be honest is that it's been rebuilt about seven times. But this is the second time. And, um, and there were a few times since then just trying to get it right. But about two years later, so by about 2009, 2010, after having put it on the back burner for a while, I'd eventually come up with this working prototype called Fairly Local, version 1.0. And it was Australia's first, first ethical product locator, online and mobile, managed by the community. And it looked a little bit like this. It was a basic site, it had a search box at the top, it had way too much text um, and hardly any kind of appealing graphics whatsoever, but it worked. And you could enter your postcode and you could find what was available near, nearby. And so if you, you know, were in Geelong, Victoria, you'd find organic larder where they have a whole bunch of products there which are fair trade. Now somebody added this from the community, added this particular listing, they knew where to buy fair trade, thought I'm going to share that with the world, I'm going to let them know through Fairly Local. How you'd, buy, how you'd find fair trade near Geelong. And so I thought, well, the website's working. We're starting to get maybe 100 hits a week, um, which is more successful than any website I'd done before, um, but by no means is a, a huge measure of success. And I thought, but it needs an iPhone app. And I don't know anyone who makes iPhone apps, but I know that 13-year-old kids on YouTube have tutorials who will tell you how to do it. And so I watched the 13-year-old kids on, on YouTube who taught me how to program in Objective-C, and I bought a Objective-C for Dummies book. And over about three weeks, I learned a few basics. I downloaded Xcode, and I learned a few basics to be able to make this app. So from the point of watching that first YouTube video to six weeks later, I had an app in the App Store. Um, and it worked, and I used it when I was out and about, and I could find fair trade. Um, that worked for about two years. Um, it was a completely custom PHP MySQL website and an Objective-C iPhone app. And if you looked at the code, and if you guys are developers, which I imagine most, if not all of you are, it's horrible. Like, it's the worst code. There's about a thousand pages for every different thing. Um, and it's just all, sp there's a few functions that I wrote, so it wasn't all lost. But by no means was a, a content management system. By no means was it something that anyone except me could work on. There were no comments. There was nothing. Um, and the performance um, uh, was questionable. But there were some, there were some kind of key, su key successes. For two years, the site averaged about 2,000 visitors a month. We had 100 brands on board who'd log on and add their products. And we had about 2,500 listings across Australia of where to find fair trade products. Uh, and so for two years, it was a resource that worked. Um, but during those two years, my journey went from freelancing to starting up this not-for-profit company with my friend Murray. And, um, 
and we took this on board. We thought, let's make a resource of this. Let's make something beautiful from this. Let's redevelop using open standards, using um, a responsive layout, using Drupal as the backbone of this project. Um, and let's make something which really sings. Let's make something which um, is just going to kind of take it to the next level. And so um, there were a few key problems that we'd learned from this first version, um, which we wanted to try and overcome. The first was poor, poor performance. Uh, the second was that it was really timely to extend. The third, that there were some major security issues and we got a lot of spam all over the website. And, um, and the third was that the design was ineffective. It, it worked in part, um, but by no means was it mapped around usability and the, and the user experience. There was no user testing. There was nothing. There was just needs to be a search box, needs to be a description of how it works, needs to be a navigation link, and it's got to have the Fairtrade logo somewhere on there. And so we thought, what are we going to do with this old website? Let's build it again. And let's prioritize good design. Let's prioritize extensibility. Let's prioritize scalability. And let's prioritize stability and security. And so this time, we wanted to rebuild it right. And so Drupal it was. And, um, and it was a natural fit. So many reasons we were leaning towards Drupal. We were not great Drupal developers at the time. Um, even now, we're still good Drupal developers, but not great Drupal developers. Um, but it was the platform that we needed. We knew it was scalable. We knew it was secure. We knew it was extensible. And we knew that we could have performance um, really tailored and fine-tuned to make sure the site doesn't go down you know, when there are four people visiting at the same time. And so this is what we came up with after about probably another year of our spare time spent on it. Just a bit. It was probably about 100 hours all up in the redesign, but you know, <laughs> it's uh, hard to find 100 hours in a year often. And so we had Fairly Local 2.0, which was still Australia's first ethical product locator, online and mobile, now powered by Drupal. And so we completely redesigned the interface. We focused it all around the search. And we completely redesigned the map. And we centered everything about location based, uh, the app, and centered everything around location-based maps. Um, and prioritized clean, slick interface, um, focused around the core features and, and functions that a user is going to need. And so I just want to give you guys a, a bit of a demonstration um, as to how the app works, what it might look like um, if you were on the website or on the mobile phone. Uh, feel free to follow along. It's a free app if you want to download it, but you are under no reason to have to download it. So we have the app, and we have the website. Now, if we open up the app, we'll see if it locates us in Kuji. It does. So we're here. This is where we're located right now. And if we want to find something near us, all we have to do is first locate ourselves and then search. We could search for a whole bunch of suggestions here. We could type in what we're looking for. Um, I think we want chocolate. And so if we do a search, we end up with a result just around the corner for Maloney's Grocer. Maloney's Grocer sells a few different types of Kokolo chocolate, which is a very amazing type of chocolate. I, I can um, vouch on its behalf. Uh, and that's it. That's all the app does. It, it tells you where it is. It tells you what they have available, and then you can just get directions or view it on a larger map if you want. That's all the app does, but it does it well, and it does it seamlessly, and it's like a tool which is just available in your hand, which you can come and go and use it as you need. Now, on the web, if we were to do the same thing, we could come here and say, okay, I'm looking for chocolate near Kuji. And it's going to return a whole bunch of results. Our, our zoom's a little larger on the website. And so we've got a whole bunch more results here, heading out to Surrey Hills and that kind of thing. Um, but we've got Maloney's Grocer. It's four kilometers away. And we have that same information here available. We can click on a product, find the information about it. We can actually find all the places nearby which sells this particular product. So if you just wanted to find a particular type of product, you can do that as well. Um, and really, that's all there is to the search on the, uh, on the website as well. We've tailored everything around. Three options, you can search, you can browse, or you can contribute. And, um, and the one thing I want to look at now is just, uh, we'll, we'll, in a bit, we'll explore how this works in, in using Drupal to power both the app and the website. But really, I've got, a block of chocolate. Yes. <laughs> Which if you pay close attention, 
I will give you this block of chocolate because I, my, my wife and I have a Cadbury Dairy Milk chocolate addiction ever since they went fair trade. And so um, we have far too much of it at home. And so I'll gladly give this away to whoever pays the most attention. Um, but I have this block of chocolate. It's located here at Drupacon Sydney and it's not listed on Fairly Local. So I could wait for somebody to think, oh, I'm going to add that block of chocolate to Fairly Local so that everyone can find it. Or I myself, having this knowledge, can think, okay, well, I'm looking for uh, Cadbury near Coogee. And I don't get any results. And so we're going to add it. And so first, I'm going to contribute. It's going to ask me to log in. I'll log in with Facebook, just so things are much simpler. And once I'm in, I can contribute. Now, it remembers that I've already searched for Coogee, so it's going to give me a bunch of stores near Coogee that I can contribute to. I don't want to contribute to any of them because we want to add our own store. It's going to be called the Crown. Look at that, I was testing it before. Crown Plaza. It's going to be a Drupal store, uh, DrupalCon category, which is not obviously there every day. I may have added that just for the presentation. Uh, and we're going to put in our location. Does anyone know the location here? Is it 242? Uh, actually, I've probably entered it. 242 Arden Street in Coogee. State. Postcode, anyone? It's not that important. 2131. Uh, and we don't have any websites or images to upload. So I'm going to submit this. And I've added the store. Now I want to start adding some products to it. And so we've got this interface which we've designed where you can say, all right, well, just start typing what you're looking for. Um, I think we want maybe dairy milk chocolate. It's going to add it to the shelf. Let's add another one, maybe Kokolo chocolate. Uh, dark 70%. Now I know as a fact that I don't have Kokolo chocolate in my bag. So I'm just going to drag that one to the bin and get rid of it. This all updates over Ajax, and so that's now available. If I come here and do my search again, we should get, and our address is a little bit wrong, the Crown Plaza, Drupacon and Coogee, should have our available block of chocolate there. And if we need to, we can just get our direction or view it on a map. And this process here is what powers the whole website. It's a community-driven website. It's about people sharing knowledge. It's about people going out and finding fair trade and then letting the rest of the world know that. It's open, open source, open, um, open source principles really applied to a, a community of people trying to find fair trade. Share your knowledge, be involved in the community, make a difference by adding what you have. Because um, when knowledge is available and free, um, everyone's empowered. And that's really all there is to the website. Um, there's a whole other kind of bunch of back ends for brands. I won't go into that now. You can ask questions later on if you need to. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time talking about things that people may not care about. Um, and so I'll move on um, and I'll head back to my presentation. And so how did we build it? Well, Drupal um, gave us a whole bunch of options to work with. But effectively, we built this on Drupal 6, um, apologies for that, with uh, location and Facebook Connect where our re real key modules. I mean, there are a bunch of other contrib modules, um, but they were the key ones which empowered us to create what we need to create in regards to user registration workflows and in regards to geocoding data um, and representing that out. Now, the main reason it was Drupal 6 um, was because when we started building it, we were using GMAP2 and, um, and there was just no work being done on the module. And so we were kind of pushed into Drupal 6 at the time. In the end, we just canned GMAP2 anyway because uh, we wanted to use Google Maps version 3. Um, and so we just kind of worked with some views templates and that kind of thing to make it work. Um, but that was kind of the reason we started with Drupal 6 at that point. Uh, and there were a few really crappy modules which we made. Um, and uh, they worked. And I'll, I'll talk about one of them in a sec, which could be a fantastic module um, if it wasn't written by me. But the concept is really nice. Um, and then we have one really intense view, which is that search view. And so it's got about seven contextual filters. Um, it's got seven uh, exposed filters and really, um, we use that to, to generate those results. Both for the, it's the same view which generates the results um, for uh, the iPhone app um, by returning JSON to the iPhone app when it's requested, and it's the same view, just with different displays, which returns those results on the website. So how do we use location? Um, the location module gave us everything we needed to to geocode our store content types. Um, there's only about, I think, maybe four content types on the whole website. Uh, there may be a little bit more than that. We have brands, we have stores, we have um, products, 
and we have listings. Now a listing is uh, really what the is powered by the search. So when somebody adds a listing, they're adding a listing of a node reference product to a node reference store. And so that's all the listing is, and that just allows us to have views which aren't, haven't got multiple relationships and are a huge kind of load on the database there. Um, it also allows us to make that nice shelf where you can add and remove products really easily. But location gave us everything we need. If we put an address in, it would geocode that and we could store longitude and latitude in the database. Um, there were a, a few explorations we did around, like I mentioned, using GMAP, GMAP um, and a few other kind of libraries to try and geocode things, but location had it all there for us at the time that we were making this. And without the country module location, uh, the, the project would have been lost. Um, so I'm very grateful to the community who built that. Um, Facebook Connect, uh, which I think might be called something else now. Um, but at the time, again, we loved Drupal, but in Drupal 6 at that point, we didn't love the registration workflow. Uh, and that was going to be a real hurdle to um, us having people contribute to the website. People would want to contribute, but if you're going to ask them to register, then they're not going to want to enter all these details, and they've got to ask questions about whether privacy is safe, and um, what you're going to do with the data, and it's just a nightmare process for someone who just wants to say, hey, here's where you buy a fair trade. And so we thought um, it's important that we have um, uh, additions to the website being mapped to users, but, um, but we need to make that seamless. And so as you saw when I logged in with Facebook Connect before, the process is fairly seamless. Now, if I hadn't registered before, there would have been one extra screen which said, do you give this app permission to you know, access your email address? Uh, and that's it. And so Facebook Connect module, um, it really enabled that in a great way. It also allowed us to um, decrease the barrier to contributing the site, but also open the site to uh, integrated social sharing. Um, and there's a, a bunch of things that came with that module where you can see which of your friends have registered to the website, that kind of thing. Um, but really just getting those permissions from users to be able to interact with them on Facebook through, um, through your Facebook app uh, is, is just a great door open to be able to explore your social connections that you have with different people. There was this one custom, custom module we made, which was called Intention. Uh, and the real purpose of Intention was to map the user's input to that view that we created. Um, now, you would have noticed when I entered that before, I had kind of two different types of keywords in there. I had, I'm looking for chocolate, and I'm looking for it near Coogee. Um, and that's hard input to decipher what they mean. It's hard to understand what the intention of a search is. What if somebody just searches for chocolate? Then you're going to have the geocode somehow near where they are or default to another country. What if uh, another city? What if somebody just wants to search for a location? Say, I grew up in Barara in Sydney. What if I just want to say, find fair trade near Barara? How do I know that Barara is not a type of product? How do I know it's not a taxonomy which is somehow grouping stores or um, products in um, term references? How do I know all that? I have to figure it out. So we wrote this custom module, which basically it looked at a few things. Um, first, it would check out taxonomies and all the synonyms related to that. And so we can have variant spellings of cafe and that kind of thing. If it found a match there, it would give points to that um, match for cafe or for chocolate. And then it would move on to the next step. Um, it would break things apart with that conjunctive of near or in um, to determine whether there were two things in there. So product near location or product in location. Um, and then it would iterate over the names of products and brands and certifications throughout a view output um, just to see if there were any matches. And so it worked quite similar to how um, the default Drupal search module would work. Um, but there are a few specifics that we needed and we weren't confident enough to be able to extend the search module to make that happen. Um, and so we wrote this, this module intention. Um, and that module is used both on the website and on the iPhone app. Um, I wish I could contribute it to Drupal but it's horrible, and um, it's tailored to our situation. So again, my intention would be to, uh, in the future, work that towards um, a better kind of approach to multiple different projects, because um, I think it's really valuable to be able to understand sentiment when somebody's doing a search. Um, and the other thing which was core was views. Naturally, um, it's core to pretty much any website that we would all create, um, but having the power to have location in a views and be able to do um, proximity filters and that kind of thing to understand how close something is to something else saved all that hassle for us to try and figure out how to do that with our own, you know, first time we did the project trying to figure out um, how you do uh, distance calculations between, you know, azimuth and the curvature of the earth and all those sorts of things, um, which were just well over my head. 
Now, that's kind of some of the core things that were really important for us to, um, to get the development working, to get the functionality there which we needed. Um, but another huge component for us was the design. Um, so one thing we really wanted to do in this project was prioritize design. We didn't want Drupal to be the, um, you know, the proverbial cart before the horse. We really thought the design's going to need to drive this. We need to understand our usability, our user experience. We need to map that out um, before we build anything in Drupal. And so we wanted to prioritize design because good design is as, in, it's as important as any great development. We need to give it the time it needs um, and we need to engage designers where needed. Um, and this was hugely important. We had some designers on our team, um, but the role of designers in um, understanding experience, a lot of the time, sometimes a designer can be quite airy in what they end up producing, which doesn't have any considerations to usability and doesn't have any considerations to um, the user experience. Um, but the ability for designers to work alongside developers is so important. It was really important on this project um, to have that conversation, to have that happening. The other thing we wanted to um, embody in this project is a mobile first design. So we wanted to explore our usability by shrinking down the constraints of our, um, of our device and then starting from there. And so when you constrain your design, you'll find your user experience priorities. And so for us, we constrained it right down. We thought we kind of want two things. We want people to be able to search and we want people to be able to contribute. They're kind of our two actions on the website. That third one, browse, kind of comes under search. It's just another way to search. Um, but we were able to shrink it down and think, well, that's what we want people to do. That's how we want people to be engaged. We want them to find fair trade, and we want them to help others find fair trade wherever they are. And so by constraining ourselves to the, you know, the width of a mobile phone, we immediately started to ask those questions, okay, what do we get rid of? What's redundant? What's verbose? What can go out the door? Um, and what are we left with at the end? And then let's build up from there and take those principles of a mobile first design and apply them to our desktop side as well. Um, we were just exploring responsive design at the time and what that meant. Um, and so we wanted to put it into practice on an internal project um, and see what it looks like to have one design um, to rule them all, so to speak. And, um, and so we were, we were trying to prioritize designing sites that respond to the limits of any device um, to ensure the best user experience no matter what website, um, the, what device. Um, the website is viewed on. And I think it was important for us to, um, to not get stuck in any particular frameworks. Um, actually, we build this on a framework called Skeleton. Um, we haven't used it since, uh, but we haven't changed it since as well. Um, it was really helpful for us to have somebody who'd done the forethought and think, all right, let's think about the type of devices we have. Let's have a really basic kind of boilerplate, boilerplate um, uh, markup and CSS to be able to um, to be able to make stuff happen. But the problem we found with this was that Skeleton was designed by someone who had an iPhone and an iPad. And so you've got four media queries. You've got your desktop, which is you know, 960. You've got um, your portrait iPad. You've got your landscape iPad. Wait, that's one or two, four. You've got your portrait iPad. You've got your landscape iPod. And you've got your portrait iPod. You've got kind of four designs. There's no fluid styles between them. Um, and so, you know, we've since then moved towards um, Bootstrap. Now, I, I took a long time to come around to Bootstrap personally. Um, there's just so much bloat which goes in there. Um, but for us as a studio, like our workflow has been transformed, being able to have um, prototyping tools in Bootstrap, um, which are, you, you've got full control to be able to extend it how you like, to be able to strip things out that you don't need. Um, and I personally, what I love about Bootstrap is the thinking behind it. And that might be because I'm, I sit quite in line with the way they've thought semantically around a few things. Um, but it, it's great for us to work in a team collaboratively with our designers, with our front-end designers, with our developers um, to really achieve uh, the best kind of mobile responsive frameworks that we can um, in the sites that we're building. Other things we had to consider with design was um, planning ahead. Now, we didn't really do this. Um, and that's the nature of having an internal project. You don't really plan ahead. You just ad hoc solutions together as you go along. Um, but we tried to, as best we can in the time that we had, to design sites um, by planning it out and ensure that usability was met. Um, and that's hugely important when you're talking about data modeling and that kind of thing. But so often it's, um, it's ignored or neglected when you're talking about design. Uh, the other thing I think this has probably been mentioned in a few different 
workshops over the couple of days. Um, but you want to be in control of your markup as well. Um, and there are ways that you can do that. Um, it's not very great in Drupal 6, um, but that was, you know, the sword we fell on by choosing <laughs> to use Drupal 6. Um, but don't let the Drupal, the Drupal defaults um, dictate your markup. You want to take ownership to ensure that you're in control of your standards. Um, and particularly in respect to your front-end developers. Um, for a front-end developer who's not all that familiar with Drupal, it can be a real nightmare to work with views which have 17 nested divs before you get from the parent view div to your output of your field. Um, so we use things like semantic views and um, taking control of the template files as best we can to do that and, um, and uh, try it as best we can to control our markup. Uh, I'm really excited about what's on the horizon in regards to that as well um, with Drupal 8. Uh, and the iPhone. What kind of lessons do we have? What are we trying to prioritize when we were making the app or remaking the app? Um, the iPhone was built rather than uh, being a web-based thing um, compiled with PhoneGap or one of those other compiling services. It was built in Objective-C. I thought I bought the book, I might as well get my money's worth. And, um, and we used Views Data Source, um, which provides a display where you can choose a whole bunch of data source outputs. And the one that we used was JSON. Um, and that was from that kind of killer view that we had, which was powering the whole website. Um, and it worked really great for us. And we've used that on a number of apps since. Um, but for us, it immediately meant we could work in our libraries. We could work with the format of JSON coming in. Um, we could work with Objective-C to ensure that we um, really prioritize um, right design and good user interface on a mobile phone. Um, you know, human interface guidelines from Apple and those kind of things obviously considered there too. Um, I've mentioned that. This is the other thing I wanted to show you. Now, this is our slice file. So this is every single element which goes together to make up the app. Um, we do it in one giant PSD. We slice everything up. And you'll notice there's two sizes for everything. Thanks, Apple, um, for your retina graphics. Um, and so we're still having to do that. I'm sure many of you guys are facing that problem on the web. And there's a whole bunch of different solutions to work with high density displays and that kind of thing. We won't go into that now. Um, but this just kind of gives a little bit of a snapshot into um, you know, how we've composed the interface. Uh, and if you look at some of these elements, like they, they carry across from the website. We've got this dark color in the backgrounds along here. We've got this strong or, um, green bar at the top. We're using the same shelf and we're using these same icons to represent different types of products. Um, we really wanted to make sure we were consistent between a mobile app, a mobile piece of software and our website, our web platform we were building on. Now the other thing, um, which came out of this, which was really interesting, is that uh, it started a conversation with Fair Trade Australia and New Zealand. We did this, you know, as a service to humanity. We really, we, it was selfish, really. I wanted to find Fair Trade near me, so I built an app for me to be able to do that. And then I said, you, rest of the world, find the information for me so that I can benefit from it. My intentions were selfish, but they were selfish in the sense of what I wanted I knew would uh, also make a difference in the world in some small way. Um, but it started this conversation for us with Fair Trade. And this happened while we were developing on Drupal. And we said to them, hey, what if we could, because uh, they wanted a resource like Fairly Local. They wanted a fair trade search engine that they could provide to their consumers. Um, and so we said, well, why don't, why don't we partner? What can we do with, with Fair Trade Australia um, to partner with Fairly Local? And so using domain access, we actually created them uh, for them a responsive, custom branded, um, fair trade exclusive, fair trade search for Fairtrade Australia. It looked a little bit like this, quite different to Fairly Local. You notice the little powered by Fairly Local at the bottom. Um, but the user experience is very much the same, tailored around that search, um, being able to have the um, intention, the sentiment there in the search as well. Um, the maps, all kind of very similar, but a different sort of display. Um, and the listings, we've lost the shelf, but everything is, is quite similar. And this is actually the exact same website. This is Fairly Local, the same database, um, the same views, everything's still powering it. We've just designed a custom theme for them. And using domain access, we can say, all right, this is the approved content which Fairly Local wants on their website. And so we don't get any of the stuff which people add which may not be Fairtrade certified. That was really important to them. So this for us was our first kind of multi-site and it was really fun exploring domain access and how we can do that. Um, there's also a, a New Zealand version, search.fairtrade.co.nz, um, which is the same kind of concept except it's limited to New Zealand data, um, which is interesting because we don't have New Zealand support on Fairly Local, but we do have it there underlying just so that we can power their website. Um, 
And so for us, this was a, yeah, a really kind of interesting process to happen alongside the building of their Drupal platform website um, to provide this service from, from one that we already built. Um, but as I kind of think about every internal project, every personal project I have, we've got to build it again. Like when you hit a dead end or you get tired of a design or something, you've got to build it again. It's the biggest hurdle we face is the fact that we built it on Drupal 6. Um, but seriously, we, we want to build it again. And we're trying to find the time um, to schedule it in to really sh make sure that we can take it to the next level again. And I, I mean, I've been working on this project personally for six years, and I think I'll probably work on it for another six. Um, just because it means a lot to me, um, because it was instrumental in my development journey um, in providing me a platform where I can explore and try new things and, and pioneer personally um, and, and push the limits of my development capabilities. Um, but what do we have to consider? Um, do we build it on Drupal 7? Uh, that's almost a debt. We don't build it on Drupal 6. That's a decision. Um, or do we wait until we build it on Drupal 8? Um, I'm really excited after the last couple of days. Um, at what Drupal 8 is going to afford us for a project like this, particularly with web services and Symfony, um, as well as just with wanting to prioritize front end um, in our design and in our workflow as a team. Um, I'm stoked about Twig and a bunch of different things which are coming in Drupal 8. Um, but we caught, caught the last wave out on Drupal 6, and, and we know that in the development of this site. Um, and so we'll probably explore building on Drupal. I, I like rebuilding this site, so I think we'll build on Drupal 7, then when Drupal 8 comes out, we'll build on Drupal 8, um, just because it's fun to keep working on it and try and you know, simplify your code and make everything more stable um, and uh, a much better experience. Um, but there are other kind of considerations which we want. Um, we have a whole bunch of modules running on the site um, to manage content access. This is an area, this is why I put myself in the two basket of, um, of Drupal development, because um, content access and those kind of things, I've never had time to bury my head in them deep enough um, to kind of figure them out. Uh, but we were able to make something work for this particular website. We were able to have content access where we can say, all right, you're a certification. You've got access to every piece of content which is marked as fair trade certified. And so you can approve that, you can do whatever you like with that content. And you can limit it so that no other user can edit that content. Every, every other piece of content, though, which is not approved as, as Fairtrade certified, it's free to any authenticated user to go in and edit and make the changes as an open website. Um, and we also have brands where we have a similar kind of limit. Say, if you have content which is, which is marked as your brand's content, um, you're the only ones who can edit that. Well, you and, and Fairtrade Australia. Um, and for us trying to figure out what are the best modules to use, how do we do that? Do we design a custom module? I thought we'd do design a custom module to make it work, and then I pulled back and thought, wow, um, if we were a Drupal shop which were really good at this stuff, we would do that, um, but we are not, and so we will not. Um, and so content access, um, with such a varied role system between certifications and brands, we would want to, in a rebuild, would want to explore a better solution there. Um, and we have a few ideas of, of how we might do that. Um, we'd also want to prioritize the social layer of what we're doing. That was kind of, um, I got left behind. That was the carriage which kind of got dropped off in the push to try and get it finished on time. Um, we had these huge intentions of making the whole thing social, making it deeply integrated with people's stories online. Um, because this is a, a website, it's a resource where people care about this stuff. There's a community of, of young ac activists, thousands of them um, across Australia, who are behind causes, um, environmental causes, uh, causes against poverty, seeing our foreign aid budget increase to 0 0.7 as we'd committed 13 years ago. People who are passionate about seeing change happen from where Australia sits in the world. Um, and fair trade fits into that. Ethical consumerism fits into that. And so we have this active community of people who are not really engaging socially. And so we'd want to deeply integrate that social sentiment throughout the website so that people can find and share um, their knowledge but broadcast that to their networks as well. Um, and uh, if, you know, the better you do your social, the more impact your site's going to have on a broader scale. And for something like Fairly Local, where the benefit is um, seeing people talking more about where our products come from, um, who's producing this where they paid a fair wage, um, when I have my cup of coffee, how important is it that I'm, I'm considering the plant and the soil which grew this and the country where it grew, and that the people who are managing that, y you know, in a cup of, um, sorry, I'm going to get <laughs> passionate about it. In a cup of $3 coffee, the, uh, the producer gets about $0.03. Cents. Um, under fair trade, that's about $0.12. Cents. 
Um, but it's, it's just so important for us to be kind of considering that. And I think there's a huge social layer which we could have in a rebuild of this site where we have an emphasis on shareability of the content, both online and on the mobile. Um, less is more. This is, uh, I could probably skip past this. It's not all that important, but I included it anyway. Um, we love less and SAS. We're, our preference is less. Um, I think everyone else here's preference is SAS from the impression I'm getting in the talks. Um, but we definitely use that in a rebuild. Um, but I think it's really important to make sure with any kind of compiled CSS that you're doing that you're not being lazy in your coding um, because you can quickly get so much bloat. And, um, and uh, less and SAS provide these amazing opportunities for us to actually have a definition for what cascading means. Um, and yeah, I, I, we would want to be smart in whatever we're coding in a redevelopment there. Uh, hosting, I hope no one has a question about how we're hosting this because it's, um, let's just say it needs to be better. Uh, and so if we were able to generate some money from this, then we would, without a doubt, move it to Acquia um, to support that just because it's not got a good hosting environment at the moment. Um, and in fact, to do this presentation for, I downloaded everything locally just in case, just in case it didn't work. And so um, if you try and find that Cadbury block of chocolate on fair trade. P.S. I've still got this. I think your hand was up first. Oh, so <laughs> feel free to share it around. I forgot to give that out before. Um, and that will disappear from the website once you finish that block of chocolate. It's a custom module we wrote into that block of chocolate. Um, the other thing that we want to do is we want to give people the option when they're on their mobile phone to be able to contribute, to be able to say, hey, look, here I am in Woolworths. I can see four fair trade boxes of tea and they're not here listed on Fairly Local. I want to scan the barcode, enter the store, and up it goes so that that's, um, that's available there to contribute. Um, to do that, we'd want to use, if this were in Drupal 6, now web services for Drupal 8, uh, and I think um, a few other modules which have um, gained prominence since we originally built this, I think REST WS or something like that, uh, might be another one. But Drupal iOS SDK um, integrates really nicely with services. Um, and basically, it gives you this whole layer in Objective-C for you to be able to create node objects and just call a node save command. And it takes care of all the, all the communication with your server. You set things up with the services module. Um, and it will give you access to users, access to pretty much any entity you can think of. Um, and it, it, it's powering um, my vision for where this could go and having um, a great, uh, it's available on GitHub. Um, if you guys want to explore that um, work habit, have, re have released that. Um, but it's a really great framework if you are into native iPhone app development at all. Um, but I guess the last thing I wanted to come back to is um, we are all uh, pioneering. When I was young, I, I grew up in the, well, not in the bush. I grew up on the bush in Barara. And, um, and I loved exploring. I loved finding new caves and imagining that Either no one's ever been here before or no one's been here for, for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, and that thought of being in the bush, being somewhere new, pioneering new frontiers, um, that kind of explorer spirit in me always got me excited. Uh, when I was a little bit older, in kind of my early teens, I realized that everything's been explored. And so I kind of quenched that out. But then I found new media and I found technology and I found these new frontiers where we can pioneer, we can push through, we can innovate, we can create something new. And that explorer spirit in me was sparked, and that's powered a lot of my, um, my bits and pixels journey, um, a lot of my design and development, and how we can find our vocation, where our skills meet the overarching needs of the world. And I think for all of us, irrespective of the projects that we're working on, we have these tools in our hands that are shaping the future. Um, and we as a company are trying to do that. We're trying to do that by the clients that we work with. We're trying to do that with the quality of work we do. We're trying to do that internally by coming up with these ideas and investing our resources into making something happen. But I think Drupal as a community is doing that as well. And I've been inspired by the talks over the last few days about how Drupal can make such a huge impact. And so I just wanted to encourage you guys in closing that you have these tools where you can pioneer and push through some of the issues we're facing in our world at the moment so we can find a more equitable world, so that we can find a world which doesn't have the man-made horror of poverty, so we can find a world um, which, is, which has climate stability um, and we're not exposed to vulnerabilities from human effects and those sorts of things. Whatever your passion is, whatever you excites you about making a difference in the world, apply your digital skills to that. Um, and together we can make a change, together we can design the future um, and we can see real positive things come out of that.
that's about all I had to say. Um, open to questions. If anyone has any questions from that, I think we have maybe, yeah, 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, the, the intention module that we made, um, it's not available online. Uh, if it was, that would be really great and we would have used it. Um, are we going to contribute that? Uh, look, honestly, probably not, uh, if I'm, I'm to be honest. Um, just because to make it a, a, a polished module which really worked in a whole bunch of settings and for you to be able to say, well, what are your sources that you want to measure intention across and how do you have a, a kind of algorithm which measures sentiment based upon these kind of broader principles of measuring that, um, that would be a pretty big undertaking, maybe a little bit um, a weight above my kind of punching grade. Um, but there, there are sentiment APIs out there um, which are available, which aren't Drupal ones. There may be some Drupal integration done there. But sentiment APIs which can look at, you know, things like um, uh, your followers on Facebook and, and measure the sentiments on kind of the general, um, you know, Twitter sphere and, and pull out some really important things about what people are saying, how they're saying it, what their sentiment in a tweet that they send is. Um, so there are those kind of things available out there um, in an open source sense and a proprietary sense as well. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, the question was um, for community contributions, um, I guess, how do you avoid um, <coughs> problems there? Like, is there any, any validation, any checking to make sure that things are authentic, things are clear? Um, and what role does domain access play in that as well? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so we have, it, it depends on the content type, really. So listings, there's no checking whatsoever. If somebody adds a listing, it's a pre pretty low priority content type. Um, it's pretty hard to spam with, spam with two reference fields. Um, except that you're just going to get incorrect data and people can just log in and delete it themselves anyway to keep that data pure. Um, for adding products, uh, we have an approval queue, which we log in and fair trade log in just to make sure we get a lot of spam in that approval queue. Um, either that or fair, tri fair trade Viagra, I'm not sure. Um, but we, we get a whole heap of spam coming through and, um, and that approval queue catches all that so it never appears on the website. And so everything's unpublished until we can go through and approve that. Uh, for stores, there's no approval queue whatsoever. If somebody adds a store, it's only going to appear online if, if people list products there, and they can't list products there which haven't been approved by us anyway. So everything's kind of interconnected to um, that central product approval um, process, which is where we have the permissions which don't allow people to publish content without us having reviewed it. Yep, but the onus then is on the community to delete that stuff as a community resource. They can just delete the products listed there. Yep. No. Yes. Yeah. Which was interesting. It was something we explored and we, and we got down to the point where this isn't our resource. This is a community resource. And so it'll need to be managed by the community in that regard. Um, and we do have back, like, if they delete a listing, it doesn't delete that node, it just unpublishes it. And so if somebody goes and tries to get rid of everything, we can go back and undo that. And we, we track what kind of unpublishing actions happen there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the, the question was, do we have a, um, there's like an auto-suggest search there. Um, that was a little jQuery plugin we wrote. Um, which is, if you view the source code of the website, you'll be able to see how it works. Um, it's, it's not great, but it works. Um, I'm, I'm pretty self-deprecating, I apologize about that. I'm actually not that bad a developer. <laughs> um, I just feel a little out of my depth with all these amazing developers around us. Um, I'll show you on the home page. Yeah, so you can see that says cafes near crow's nest. It is this suggestive search where it's got taxonomies loaded in, so if we do chocolate, near, and there's a few popular Australia cities in there, so you'd be out of your Melbourne, maybe, maybe not Melbourne, Sydney, um, I probably took Melbourne out because I don't like Melbourne, um, uh, what's like Toowoomba maybe, Tamworth, so there's a few, sorry, well, let's hope it is, nah, maybe Launceston, nah, sorry, 
Maybe I'll add that in for you. Um, but you can enter anything you like here. So you say, I, I want to find copy near 25 Clinton Close for our height. No guessing as to whether that's where I grew up. Um, and it will actually geocode. So that bit there is geocoded by Google. Um, so we send in the address. They give us back longitude and latitude. And we feed that in. I don't know if you can see it up here, but this is our view. It's pretty intense. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different arguments, which is oh, this, the nature of this URL is determined by intention. Um, and we explain the intention down here. So it says you're searching for chocolate, and um, we search near 25 Clinton Close for our height. So you can do anything. You can say, well, I'm looking for Cadbury um, near Hornsby. Well, let's see, well, let's see if it fixes that. Yeah, look at that. Autocorrects it as Hornsby, um, thanks to Google. And it found the brand of Cadbury to be able to see what all the Cadbury products are that are available in Australia. Uh, it will, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it will. Just the geo geocoding, uh, does it just does that look up the the case of the result and say this is the right place for us? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So just longitude and latitude and the short name of that particular geocoding. So sorry, the question was, um, are we caching the geocoding? Um, what happens when we when we get it returned, or are we having to request that from Google each time? Uh, we do cache that, but if you do a new search, it will do. It's only on this search command which it does the geocoding. Um, as well as this little button down here, which is better on the home page, where you can say, let's figure it out where I am. I don't know if this is going to work. It's giving me Waverly, New South Wales. Yeah, um, yeah that one there will do a geocode. And, and, is, and is that part of the local No, that's just HTML5's geocoding API, um, doing that. And then we send and the longitude right. latitude we get from that, we send that to Google. It returns us the okay. readable name. And we store that in the session. So now if I was to search for, I just want to find chocolate, it's going to find chocolate near Waverly. Uh, oh, maybe not. Chocolate near Sydney. No, products only. Yep, we get that question a lot. Or online stores. We don't do online stores either. It's just physical location. There are other services online which list those ones. Fairly local is just about local products available in local stores. I apologize for the extra confusion, but the other thing that you said um, in both the questions that I might have missed is that you don't have to use dot com um, for your copy. Um, in this in this version of the of the update, uh, can you write this in in, in Word or Excel? Nah, write it. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> 